Okay, hello. Uh, I am I am Yanni. Thank you for coming today to our meetup. I work for the cloud database engineering team here at Netflix, and one of the things that uh, we're looking is using a graph solution. And therefore, we thought of uh, maybe we can have other experts come in place and and tell us a couple of the ideas they have, and teach us a couple of lessons. So um, so Viren. Bonnie and I thought that maybe we can organize a meetup and have and start opening that uh, discussion. So um, thank you so much for coming today. Hey, um, Xavier is going to talk about Bad Wolf and uh, the graph database at Google, and then uh, Frigen and Vikram from Netflix they are going to talk about the Titan DB use case here at Netflix. And then um, after each talk, we're going to have Q and A. And in the end, uh, we'll have desserts, drinks, and you can guys can hang around and have fun. So thank you so much for coming, and I will let Xavier um, start his presentation. Can you hear me? Very good. Thanks, Yoni, for the intro. A um, couple of disclaimers. I'm not an expert on anything, as you will see in a minute. Um, most of the stuff, if you are hoping a nice and polished presentation, that's not going to be the case either. But mostly what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about what we have been doing for a while, uh, which eventually turned into an open source project. As you can see, that's my presentation going by. So, <clears throat> there we go. Let's see if I can fix it. Uh, okay, that may work. If I can find my mouse. Yes. Okay, so hi, my name is Xavier, uh, or Xavier Duran. Uh, I accidentally work at Google, but what I'm here today to talk is a little bit about some of the uh, open source project that we open source like probably a year ago under the name of Bad Wolf Project. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what is and what is not Bad Wolf. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more also about why we needed to build something like this um, and go over some concepts. Please stop me anytime. I uh, may also ask you some questions in a moment. And I want to talk not too much about the architecture, just how basically the things are organized. And maybe if have time, I can show you some demos of how we use some of these queries. Um, so what Bad Wolf um, is and what is not is a complicated question. People, when they hear graph stores and all these things, they have all sorts of different ideas. Uh, we started with something very simple. Uh, we needed to an easy way to model uh, and changing uh, ill-defined concepts. Um, I also I am accidentally the TL for a team in Google that works on fighting spam and abuse. Uh, yes, those guys that filter the bad stuff that comes your way. And you can imagine that there's a lot of things that change pretty fast. Uh, and one of the things that we needed was the ability to express new concepts and being able to reason about these concepts without having to build yet another piece of code or productionize any other thing. We wanted an easy way to express concepts and statements. Um, a statements has a nice property. I'll get to that in a moment. The model has graphs, so that's why we are here talking about graphs databases. And you can also bake some reasoning to it. So we'll see what I mean by that in a, in a couple of slides. Um, also, we don't intend that ever this for being this um, high powerful analysis tool. Um, there are a bunch of other options out there that you can use. Uh, we are mostly focusing on being able to express concepts that in production we can use on real time to query the system and make some inference uh, when we need it. So as I said, I'm not going to talk about bulk analysis. I'm not going to talk about any specific implementation of uh, the backends or the storage. We don't care much about that. Um, and we don't care about providing it as a service, you'll see why in a moment. Before I continue, can I ask you a question? Um, how many people know RDF? How many people know what it's a triple? Okay. Sorry guys, I'm going to bore you a little bit. But with a little luck, we are going to be able to cover, uh, to cover some of the stuff I wanted to do. So 
you'll, keep in mind, you'll define problems, new concepts all the time, statements that change over time. This is also another thing that it's kind of important for us. And the flexibility to model uh, without having to change the schemas or code is also crucial when you are pressed for time. Uh, so, as I said, I'm going to talk about examples and I'll show you some examples of what I mean by modeling. And I'll start with a simple example. Um, let's take the first look at there. Charles Darwin was born in Shrewsbury. Simple statement, right? We have some subject, which is Charles Darwin. We have some action or verb, which is born. Uh, and we have an object, which is the city where Charles Darwin was born, which is Shrewsbury. Very straightforward, right? I can have another kind of a statement. I can say Shrewsbury has a population of 6,000. Very straightforward again. We have subject, Shrewsbury, a predicate. Here, if you're an RDF hardcore, you start talking about properties. I'm just going to ignore that. But I'm still predicating some property against that subject. And now the difference is, if you remember the previous one, where I have the object that it's another entity in my system, what now I have is an object, which is a property, which is the value of 6,000. Um, properties usually refer to uh, things that can be text, numbers, floats, blobs, whatever. And to twist that a little bit more, I'm just going to add one more example, which is uh, our statement, not exam example of a statement, which is that Nikola Tesla knew that Charles Darwin was born in Shrewsbury. So it's still a simple statement. We have a subject, which is Nikola Tesla. We have a predicate, which is new, but now we are predicating something, and the object that we are predicating is not an entity, like before, where we had Charles Darwin, and it's not a value, but it's a whole statement again. So, for those in RDF land, you may remember this as reification. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but think about what I've been going over. I have statements that are entities. You can think these as nodes in a graph. We have verbs, which are the things that link those entities together. And entities can be entities themselves, like with types, like person, Charles Darwin, or they can be other statements, uh, which are slightly more complex. Do I make sense so far? Yes? Okay, so I can put this in a graph, because we like graphs, and we want to talk about graph storage. Uh, I'll start with a simple one. Remember the first one we saw is Charles Darwin uh, was born in Shrewsbury. I can represent that that way. Uh, on the right side, I have a property that says that Chesbury has a population of 6,000. And down here, I have the other weird uh, statement that says that Nikola Tesla knew something. And what something meant was that uh, a statement that Charles Darwin was born in Chesbury. You'll start, as I said, I'm not going to talk much about verification, but you see that there's this weird entity in the middle that says blank. Uh, you can think about these blank entities as a description of a statement. It's not an entity itself, it represents the entity statement. And I'm going to leave it at this for now. So there's a, also a recurrent caveat if you think about um, modeling data and if you are in press on real production systems, usually you have to deal with something uh, like this. Um, quick question, how many pencils did you have in your desk? Today I have 10, right? So is this a universal statement like the one before that Charles Darwin was born in Shrewsbury? Yes, no, yes, no? Okay, so the, you start guessing, right? Because there's something that changed, right? This is only valid at some point in time. Basically I'm, watched, I'm staring at my desk and now I know that there are 10 pencils. Maybe I turn my back and some colleague comes and still one of my pencils, now I have nine. So I can work a little bit down the path. Remember that weird statement I had before that had statements in it. So I can say I have 10 pencils and I have them at that point in time, right now. Okay. So now I'm totally sure that if I say that I have 10 pencils now, that's what I meant. Not yesterday, not the day before. So as you can imagine, if I have to build this every single time, it starts becoming kind of complicated. And time is something that we use a lot for reasoning about all sorts of things. If you think about how you store data, how you retrieve data, what you did yesterday, time is a very important concept. 
So instead of going down the route of doing the rectification, um, we'll see that we can do some of these things slightly different. For instance, we define in Bad Wolf two kinds of predicates. And we're going to have predicates that are immutable, that represent statements that don't change, that they are always going to be true, if you want to think about it that way. And then we have also statements like the second one, which says that Chesbury population 6,000, that we know that changes over time, right? Tomorrow somebody is going to be born. Unfortunately, somebody tomorrow is going to pass away. So the population fluctuates, and it's important to know when that value was true. So we're going to call those temporal predicates. OK, so how we model the stuff in that wolf, as easy as this, um, we're going to represent those predicates as born in this weird bracket notation with no dates, nothing. That means that it's always true. And it's one of these statements that don't change. Uh, temporal predicates are the ones that we measure with this thing. And you'll find inside what we usually call a time anchor, which is when that statement was anchoring time. You can think about time as a line. And you anchor these statements along the line. So now you know that at that point, in that line, there was a statement that was true. OK? Um, I talk about entities. Um, how we represent entities? Entities are going to be the equivalent of the nodes in our graph. Uh, we split entities in two components. Uh, first part that we call types, and the second part that we call IDs. Types are things to express ontologies of how we organize things. Um, Charles Darwin is the person, so the first part is the person. The second part is the ID, which identifies that node. Uh, another example, uh, Nikola Tesla is also a person, but we express it like person Nikola Tesla. I talked before that some of statements are considered properties that they describe values, like the population example. Um, we borrow here some of the notation, if you are familiar with RDF from RDF land, where you have the value and the type. And you can have booleans, integers, floats, stacks, or blobs. That's all we support. We don't support anything else in that world. And Statements can be expressed as what we call triples. You saw those multiple times already. Uh, each triple has a subject, a predicate, and an object. So the only thing to keep in mind is triples are immutable. I write one of these triples. There's nothing to add there. I cannot edit. I cannot change it. If I change it, what I'm doing is creating another triple. So keep that in mind. So back to the graph. Remember this graph that we used to have before? Um, I can express it as a graph or I could express it as a collection of triples. And you see that the statements we were talking before. I have now Charles Darwin, born in Chesbury, the city population, Nikola Tesla knew that weird thing, that it's a black dot. Um, a convention in Bad Wolf is the type underscore is blank, so it has no type, and that's how we uh, create these nodes that bind together uh, what, if you're familiar with RDF, means reification. Clear so far? Questions? OK. So this is how we model the data. So all the data is going to be modeled as these triples. How we store and organize this data? Um, if you look at the open source project, you'll find that it contains very few things. If you are expecting a gigantic system, database, etc., it only contains the following. It contains a library, which is written in Go which contains a lexer, a parser, a semantic checker, a planner, and an executor. If you have done compilers, this sounds familiar to you. If you have think about having a full system, what it means is this library talks to what we call drivers. And I'll tell you about drivers in a moment. But what can you do with the library and the command line tool? You can do the usual things that you would expect. You can import data into graphs. You can export data out of graphs. You can query the graphs. There's some REPL. There's some clearly rudimentary JSON endpoint uh, you can issue queries about. And the more important part of that is, uh, of the whole uh, library, is that it uses the interfaces defined in one particular file. The idea there is you want to have drivers for storage, right? Remember, this is agnostic. When I start talking about this, it's like I'm not going to talk about any kind of storage. So how can I abstract that? Uh, through interfaces, I'm not going to go with the details, but there's two kinds of interfaces that you have to implement if you want to have some storage. 
And one is the one that it's called store, which allows you to create and remove graphs, drop it, list them, what you would expect. And the second one is called graph, which is the one that allows you to add and remove triples or query uh, with low level primitives. Um, if you get bored and start digging on the graph, you'll find things like, give me all the triples that has this object, or give me all the triples that has this object, or literally give me all the triples that has this subject and object. And those are different methods you're going to implement for your driver. Um, why is this important? Uh, it distracts us from the storage. Um, there's some information that goes into the driver and there's some information that comes back. And then the parser of the lecture and the executor is the one that takes charge of the actual execution of whatever query or operation you want to run. Um, some people are shocked if you go to the library uh, and the open source project, there's only one driver implemented and it's called memory and it's a volatile one. It stores things in memory and it allows you to test everything. But if you kill the job, everything is gone, right? Um, I got bored someday and I write another one that is persistent, which is the one uh, I may show you a little bit today. Uh, that it's built on BoltDB. Uh, this is like key value pair, transactional key value pair. But this is an example, right? You can just go and write your own. Uh, if you want to write this back like ended by MySQL or any other sort of storage, um, big table APIs, etc., you can go and do it yourself. So the other piece of what BatWolf is, is VQL. Which VQL stands for, you guess it, BatWolf Query Language. Remember we talk about RDF? Disclaimer again, if you have done in that universe, you know a thing called Sparkle. Okay, this is going to sound very familiar to Sparkle. If you know what the Sparkle is, you know SQL, right? So you're going to start seeing that this looks very close to some SQL uh, dialect. What you can do with the Sparkle, sorry, with web BigQL queries, you can create graphs, you can drop graphs, you can show which graphs you have, yeah, be useful. You can select, like SQL, like you can select stuff out of the graph. You can insert, you can delete. And the last two I'm going to skip, um, it goes down to the rabbit hole. Um, those two are for, imagine that you have facts. Typical example um, that you find in the literature. I have a predicate that defines parenthood, right? And now I want to define the concept of grandparent. Uh, I could query those two things all the time, but maybe I can construct a new fact uh, out of these two that it's called grandparent automatically out of the query. Um, those are what construct and destructs are here for, but don't worry, we're not going to talk about those today. So, demo. Fingers crossed, I have a demo. Um, I'm going to start with something. Uh, first. Uh, as I said, this is an open source project. Anybody can use it. I went out and grabbed some data. Uh, I started with the Stanford um, Network Analysis Project. It has a nice collection of network data, including things from Facebook, Twitter, and you can imagine a bunch more. Um, and there's uh, another data set, which is um, population, uh, which says how many people live in cities and where these cities belong in countries. So I went and get those. And to get it up and running, the only thing you have to do is you just go, uh, take the command line tool, you create a graph. Yes, you can create more than one graph. They are going to be empty. And then you just go and load uh, the data. What loading data means that I took that data set and transformed it into triples. And the only thing I'm doing now is importing all these triples into the storage. So well, now I'm good. I have all these things loaded. Now we are going to cross our fingers. So, as I said before, I can show... Oh. Graphs. Don't worry, I'm not going to be typing much. I'm going to cheat soon. Uh, these are the graphs. Whoops, no, these are not the graphs. This, can you hear? So, oops, again. So as you can see, there's two graphs there down here. One's called snap, the other is called event. And what we can do now is, and I'll get back to this in a moment. We can ask ourselves questions now that we have this data. I imported some data 
from one of these social networks um, that are available in that repository. And I'm going to start asking questions that graph contains the usual stuff. You have profiles and it has properties for each of the profiles and it has follower links between them. The UN, as I said, is basically country, city, and population. Um, I kind of start asking questions like, what is the most popular last name in that data set, right? That's pretty straightforward. Um, we are going to try to do it live, otherwise don't worry. I have the results there. So how could I express that particular query? Control here. Okay. Oh. My mouse. Okay, this is going to be kind of painful. I can show you the demo later, so I'm going to cheat. So this is what happens when you write that query. Um, the important part is, remember, I want to know uh, which is the more popular name in that data set, right? So there's a predicate called last name. Um, as you can see, it's a predicate that doesn't change. We can argue about that or not, but let's assume that it doesn't change. Um, and the only thing I'm doing is asking, hey, give me all the subjects and objects that match that last name predicate and group them by the object, which is the name, um, count how many you have and order them and there you go, and limit to them. Surprise, surprise, the more popular name is David in that data set, right? Pretty straightforward, right? As you can see, it has a very, a very close flavor to SQL, if you haven't seen the Sparkle before. So it also gives us the ability for people that don't code, but they know how to write queries, to get familiar on how to explore the data and write queries, right? So it simplifies quite a bit of stuff. Um, another question, what did the, uh, the universities have more Davids? It's a very pressing question. Now that I know that David is a more important name in the data set. Uh, which are the top universities that have Davids? Um, you see that for doing that, now I'm writing a slightly, the important part is just look at the where clause. Uh, you see that I have the same last name, but now I'm starting from last name David, which is a note in the graph, and say, give me all the last name profile IDs. And now for all those profile IDs, look at which university they are. And now the same thing, just select that university and count and sort and rank and give me the top 10. And basically what I get is, Northwestern is the one that has the more Davids in that data set. Pretty straightforward, right? Uh, the important part here is you start seeing that what I'm doing there with those two clauses is I'm traversing the graph. I started in a node and I'm traversing the graph that is connected to that node. Another silly question. Uh, top universities of folks that follow, sorry, top universities of folks followed by EYUC fellows. Um, same example again, I start with somewhere. Uh, U of I, and I say university. I'm going to get all the members in that graph that belong to that university. And I'm going to get all the followers, and then from all the followers, I'm going to get all the universities. And again, I'm going to count and sort, et cetera, and group. And you get Sonoma State University. This is the thing that is more popular in that data set for UIUC students. Um, also University of Philippines. You can see where this is going, right? Um, another example, but now we are going to twist it a little bit and we are going to start looking at the other side of the coin. Now I'm using the other data set, it's the one that has populations. Uh, again, I am going to query and do some sums, I'll get to that in a moment. But if you look at the word clause, I'm doing the same thing I was doing before. I'm starting with some country. I want to look at the top US cities accumulated in the population for that data set, which has around 15 years of data. So what I'm going to do is give me all the cities in the US, um, 
and then for that city, um, give me all that stuff, count and so forth. The important difference between these and the previous ones is you saw that now between those brackets, there's a weird thing, there's a comma. Remember that I said that temporal statements are anchoring time, right? So what I'm saying here is like, give me everything across all time. There's no constraint on the date. So it's going to give me all the time data that I have and it's going to accumulate this. So if you think about what New York City is, is basically the accumulation of all the populations that has been recorded across the years, right? The same thing with Los Angeles, Chicago, and so forth. Make sense? Uh, and here is where you start seeing that we can start doing some other kind of reasoning. Um, I'm going to ask the same thing as I asked before, but I want to ask this uh, in a way that says, give me that accumulated population, but before 2005. That means that I want only to explore from that continuum only all the data that is older than 2005. Uh, how do I express that? Uh, as you can imagine, those brackets now start making sense. It's like an interval. Uh, what I put on the right side is the termination. What I put at the beginning is the starter. If I don't put anything at the beginning, it says since the beginning of time. If I don't put anything at the end, it says till the end of time. Uh, I run the same query, top cities are the same, but you start seeing that there's some difference down there and how the population has changed. Very straightforward, right? Um, this is where it gets entertaining. Uh, remember that I said that I have two data sets, right? And one has populations, the other has the social network. But one thing that we haven't talked about it is if you look at the from, now I can put two of these graphs together. Um, if you're in SQL, you're going to start thinking about joins and all these things, no. What that comment means is like you take those two graphs and now you create a new graph which contains all those graphs. Pretty, straight, pretty simple. And what I'm doing there is, as you can see, start querying triples regardless of the graph. Um, the place and that profile ID comes from the snap graph. The population predicate comes from the UN graph and basically here what you're doing is, hey, give me uh, all the cities that this individual was uh, before and the population that those cities contained before 2014. And this is the result you get. Um, if you're wondering why Toronto and Vancouver has two dates for the same thingy, the UN data is kind of noisy, so I didn't clean it up. So anyway. And that was pretty much what I wanted to show you. That's it. And yes. Uh, wait, I need to give you a mic. So when you're reading from both the graphs, mm -hmm. is Bad Wolf uh, dynamically merging the graphs or Yes. Or is it, is it treating it as two separate data stores and uh, it's uh, executing the query? Remember that I say that the library is a collection of things. There's a lecture, blah, blah, blah. There's a planner and an executor. Um, that executor is not very clever, but it knows how to do intelligent stuff. So if you're querying from two graphs, uh, it's going to parallelize those two and it's going to query both and then try to merge the data. Does that make sense? Which is only the results, right? Not yes. the graphs itself. Correct. Um, if, if you go and check the interfaces that define the drivers, the drivers always look the same. Uh, query with some set of constraints and it returns some channel with a bunch of data. And then the library and the planner is the one that merges those data and try to drop the data that it doesn't need, try to converge, merge and so forth. That's why, remember, at the beginning I was saying, this is not intended for large analysis, processing, etc. If you try to query everything under the sun in a graph, this is going to blow because most of it is done in memory. And the main goal is, as I said, for traversals that start in a node and then you have some pattern that you want to explore on the graph, which basically revolves into a narrow set of triples that you resolve in memory.
Does it require too much memory or like how does that work? Um, graphs are tricky. Uh, you can query things and you can blow yourself if you're not careful. Uh, the main reason is the, some graphs are very popular. For instance, if you think about, let's continue with the social network example. You have one very popular profile. It's going to have a lot of followers, right? Like millions of followers. Uh, if you want to query all of them in memory, yeah, it may not be the best idea. Um, if you can narrow that before you go to the query, like the example I was showing before, I start with some CD and then I do um, that kind of filtering before. The memory uh, joining and merging is way more efficient. So, the target data size, where graph graph databases are actually useful, probably they're not useful for all size all data sizes. Like I'm just what um, is the most optimal usage? Uh, as I said, we are not targeting large volumes of analysis. We can deal with large graphs, but the query is focused only on narrow slivers of that graph. That's basically what Bulkwalk is using, and that's why it's solving most of this in memory, because what we are targeting there is, can we be as fast as we can merging and returning this data? Uh, I mentioned before, is like if you think about it, most of the rationale behind that is we want to use it in some serving system, or we want to be able to give you answers quick when you start from a node. If you think about SQL, uh, I'm going to make an analogy there, you can go and query your SQL and say, hey, run this complex SQL statement, right? And it's going to take hours to run because it has to join merge filter, yada, yada, yada. But you can also use that system for, hey, serving in production where you have a very specific key and a set of indexes that you have built to serve that query, right? So we are more on that front than in the large analysis bulk part, because most of the resolution is done in memory. So you're basically bound for how, many, how much memory you have to be able to merge those results, process them, and be able to serve them. So for those applications where you're targeting graph databases, That's one part. The other part is with this model, if you remember, I can create new statements out of the blue, right? I don't need to change the schema. I don't need to create a new driver. I don't need to compile anything. If I have a system that needs to have no new concept, I can just go and throw a new more triples in there, and the concept is there, and it's available for querying. Um, if you think about fast dynamic changing environments where concepts are important and they move along and you're basically trying to play catch and the mouse sometimes, and those are really basically the reason why this is useful. Did I answer your question? Um, trying to understand where they're actually useful. I'm new to this topic, so. Because Google has a, a cloud platform, they have very performant databases, even AWS. And they can crunch big data. So I was just trying to see, you know, where graph databases might be useful. Yes, as I said, there are better solutions for that kind of analysis. This is not what we are targeting with this project. We are mostly targeting the ability to add and remove stuff, the ability to query that information pretty fast. I have a question around um, something similar about uh, as you develop or working on um, this product, or at least this API, or whatever, this project, if I may. Um, what are some of the use cases that you are targeting to when you are actually working on it? Some of the, maybe, you know, what are your thoughts, or at least, uh, can you talk about some of those? Thank you. Uh, not really. All right. I'm not allowed to talk about that. Um, what I can tell you, though, is, as I said, I work on a spam and abuse. So most of the stuff we deal involve these kind of changing concepts. If you think about it, about spam reviews, is you're trying to adapt to um, agents that are going to disrupt some part of your system, right? So we need the ability to model those. We need the ability to extract. And that's all. You can use TPUs for. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can use machine learning for everything. You can build deep neural networks. There's a lot of papers on how you can do. 
Um, oh, um, th this is not a problem with Google. This, if you think about it, um, machine learning has turned into subsumed this into these deep neural networks. But there are other kinds of machine learning that requires knowledge representation and reasoning. Uh, typical examples, uh, there's there's a very big difference in using decision trees and neural networks, right? The first one, I can look into it, and it tells me something about the problem and the structure of the problem. The second one is harder, it may be slightly more accurate, but it's like a black box, right? So there are places where you want to have machine learning, which you can expect, and you want the ability to be able to express concepts and relations and reason about those things. Um, it's hard for me to do it on black boxes, right? And if you think about problems where you are kind of on the hook for mistakes, where the cost of the mistake outweighs the cost of not making the mistake, you want to start having some of the ability to express and reason why you're making some of those decisions. This is a traditional discussion with machine learning. Right now it's all deep neural networks, but if you look at the history of how we got there, there has been a lot of um, other approaches where, are, for instance, rules are a very simple example, but that allow you to um, look into the problem and being able to explain why you make that problem and being able to correct those easily than with some of these black box approaches. I have uh, two, three more questions. Uh -huh. One behind, one in front. Uh, actually, the most important feature of uh, graph database is graph traversal. Um, but you showed this BQL language uh, as a plain uh, SQL-like language. Mm -hmm. um, does uh, Bad Wolf allows you to traverse the graph? I mean, uh, the, uh, the complex traversal queries and... Um, it may have not been clear, but when you look at that where clause, what you're actually defining is a pattern on the graph and the way you're going to traverse it. Um, there's one thing which is kind of entertaining. Uh, if you think about it, it's closures against the traversals. Those are really expensive. Um, right now, what we force you to do is to enumerate exactly how you want to traverse the graph by writing those predicates. Did I answer? Uh, yeah, there's, there's, you can, for instance, a typical example, I have entity A, entity B, give me, are they connected? I need to answer this, that means that I need to traverse the graph to be able to explain this. Yeah. Um, usually if you look at uh, a Sparkle and the work in RDF, there has been some approaches where they did closures on the traversal. Um, IQL was the first one out there that did traversals. And the problem with the traversals is extremely expensive if you want to do it. Um, and not pre-compute it. So there's some trade off there on how you can pre-compute traversals um, as you insert data or how you can just do those on query time, which are really expensive. If the dimensionality, if the connectivity of the graph is high, uh, you may have problems traversing that because it may not be trivial. Um, we have been exploring for a while on doing the pre-computation uh, on the open source project can we, because every time you add a triple, if you know exactly what kind of traversals you do, you can pre-compute that. Um, there are some interesting problems there is, if you never delete data, that works like a chump. I can pre-compute all the traversals and I'm going to give you a closure that it's really fast. The problem is when I remove that data, then I have to recompute it. And it's not trivial to do recomputation and it becomes close to the problem that you were saying that it's very expensive to do the traversals in some in, in a generic case. In concrete cases is if you can optimize for some of these traversals, but in the generic case it can it depends on the structure of the graph and how expensive it's going to be. Like an example, for example, give me all friends of my friends. This is really simple traversal. And that's trivial. You just basically write two clauses and you're done. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. And also, second question that uh, you said that it's possible to implement uh, the driver using any database, which means that you actually affected by database implementation. So you can't yeah. 
uh, store data how you want to store it. You can't use the optimization on disk, for example, or in memory optimizations uh, to store the data, which probably affects the performance a lot. That's one of the things that I wasn't planning to do. If you want, we can talk about it. Um, there's a, writing a driver is not a trivial task because you need to map those concepts into something that actually works. For instance, example with PQ, uh, with BoldDB is very useful because what they actually do by default is do memory mapping of files. Um, that's extremely fast and close to in-memory access. If you want to write a driver for SQL, you're going to start having to pay the price of, hey, how I store these entities? How many indexes do I want? How these indexes should be stored to be able to be able to fast, uh, to serve fast? And how I am going to be able to express some of these concepts of relation. Uh, as you see, the triple simplifies a lot of it. But basically, if you look behind the hood, everything boils down to some storage with six indices in memory if you want to serve fast. Um, because of the possible combinations between the triple um, pairs that you can set. Right? You have three components, you at least need six to be able to serve that. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, writing those drivers is tricky and you spend a lot of time doing performance tuning. Um, for instance, uh, BoldDB is very trivial because you can just basically, it's also written in Go, you can do the profiling, you can see what's going on. Uh, if you use MySQL, you have to start thinking carefully about how to put those indices, which kind of indices, where to put them. Pretty sure you're more familiar. Why you decided that. to use this uh, driver-based architecture then? Uh, a big problem. I have no control on storage. I sometimes have to use multiple things. Uh, things change underneath me. The next greatest storage is going to come tomorrow uh, and I may need to write a move because I don't have control on that. So this gives me freedom on how I organize my, my data and query it. And then I can do the extra mile of doing this for the extra effort of going and optimizing for a particular one. Uh, it's, as I said, we don't intend to build a whole storage system. It's just a way to model the graphs. Uh, how easy is it to load existing triple stores like N triple and TTL? Sorry? How easy is it to load? Oh. So those are, yeah. Stores? Uh, yeah, it's with it. It's a degenerated form of TTL um, of Turtle, which okay. only supports triples, who specify triples. And uh, what is the maximum number of uh, nodes, or what is the biggest graph that you have built using Badwood? Uh, I cannot answer that. But I'm going to tell you it's big. <laughs> so, um, what are your thoughts on uh, Gremlin as a uh, substitute oh, for? Yeah, I, I, the Gremlin is something that us software developers love because you has a programmatic way of expressing how you traverse the graph and you have control on how you organize the cursors, etc. cetera. Uh, if you think about non-software people like analysts and other folks that are more on the statistic base, they are kind of more comfortable with things like SQL-ish looking like. That was why we went down that path because none of all the users are supposed to be expected to be um, software engineers. Another related question is uh, how, how would you compare like two uh, storages that are not graphs but maybe like deeply nested protos? Deeply nested protos. Um, right, the relations are not very uh, deep, but it's like uh, very nested and very a lot of repeated. Um, we can talk about this offline. Um, it involves a couple of things. It involves using reification and doing some magic mapping. For instance, if you're talking about protos between the proto path and how you express that thing into triples. Um, there's pretty straightforward ways to do it coming from the RDF wall, um, where you can map those data structures into reified triples, and then you basically would upload it. The only thing that changes when you start doing reification is your queries became slightly larger, because if you remember that blank note, 
is something you have to query and adjust, but it's, it's totally doable. Okay, thank you so much, Xavier. Thanks. Um, now, please, Jane Baker. Uh, about uh, digital asset management. And I got. Hi everybody, um, I'm Firuze um, here at Netflix uh, along with Vikram. Uh, we're gonna uh, talk about Titan DB's uh, usage at Netflix um, in the content platform engineering um, org. So uh, today we're gonna go over um, this agenda, which is gonna be um, talking about what we do, um, the uh, application which we have, um, which is called DAM, Digital Asset Management, uh, why we're using Titan DB for it, and um, some of the internal details of Titan DB as well as um, our digital asset management um, service. And uh, we'll give you some statistics on um, what we have and uh, what we have um, faced, uh, the advantages and challenges we've faced with Titan DB. And we'll go over um, an example use case um, and a demo. Um, so as an overview, um, content uh, platform engineering is uh, where we make all the movies go live on Netflix. Uh, so it uh, deals with a lot of um, uh, entities and assets, uh, basically uh, digital entities and assets. And uh, all these uh, entities need to be shared across different applications. And um, with uh, the growing number of uh, such entities and um, the, relate the fact that they're all related, uh, we have designed a graph database uh, to store um, this set of data. Uh, DAM, again, uh, is the sh mm, da digital asset management um, service which we have uh, you being used by uh, different teams across content engineering uh, to store um, all the mm, information uh, which we'll cover here. Uh, so it, it, um, it stores all the metadata for all the digital assets across um, Netflix uh, in this uh, use case um, and uh, all the data which um, are related could be connected or not. Um, they could be of different kinds of uh, metadata so it, um, it is um, customizable for each um, application as to what kind of uh, data they're storing and uh, the data is um, basically able to be shared and uh, there is always uh, security and auditing around the assets and uh, the assets are um, uh, searchable and it, the system is highly available. So um, there's no downtime on it. Um, here we'll go over an example of um, a simplified example of um, how these assets are in the database. Um, so for example, we have an artwork uh, which may have um, multiple uh, formats of it. Uh, the artwork is related to a movie um, as well as a person um, and a character. So, so it could be uh, part of a mm, movie like um, Puzzle Cards uh, and the person could be Kevin Spacey and the character is Frank Underwood. Um, the movie would have um, different display sets for different uh, languages um, and each uh, display set uh, could contain multiple video and audio tracks, um, as well as text tracks. Um, it could um, have uh, trailers uh, created and montages. Um, and the montage could be uh, related to a video track of another display set. Um, and here we, you're also seeing uh, subs and dubs that are created for, um, for these video tracks or audio tracks. Um, so this uh, shows how uh, the database is, um, the data is a graph, um, naturally fits a graph database. 
and uh, why we were storing it as a graph DB. Um, but why did we choose Titan DB to uh, store the data? Uh, Titan was uh, open source. Um, it was um, optimized for billions of nodes, um, so uh, fit our use cases. Um, highly concurrent, and um, it had support for Elasticsearch and Cassandra. Um, with the Cassandra, uh, it also supported the, um, the Netflix ASEAN-X driver, uh, which is the Cassandra client um, open source um, driver we have at Netflix. Um, and um, it supported the hosted model of um, the Cassandra and the Elasticsearch. Uh, so it, uh, it's much easier to uh, maintain. Uh, some of the internal details of um, Titan DB, uh, as shown here, we're an application of it. Um, so we we're using um, Gremlin language, uh, which is a Tinker Tinkerpop API um, to query the data. There are also management APIs uh, within Titan. Um, underneath, um, they are uh, able to store the data in Cassandra, um, HBase, or Berkeley DB, uh, but we have used the Cassandra. And uh, they also provide indexing um, uh, using Elasticsearch, Solar, or Lucene. Um, along with the uh, transaction processing, they also have analytical processing, uh, which uh, is based on Spark, Giraffe, or Hadoop. Um, but in this case, we have not used um, the analytics part of it. Uh, internally, the data is um, stored, um, as shown here, by a, ver a, a row is um, represented by a vertex ID. Each row stores uh, properties and edges um, of a vertex, um, and uh, they're all sorted. Um, the queries are all uh, done by the vertex ID. For um, more complex queries, Elasticsearch or indexing is used um, to, um, to be able to do range queries uh, or other types of um, uh, queries. Uh, next, uh, we'll go more into uh, the internal nodes of DAM, and Vikram will go over that. Hi, I'm Vikram, and I'll go the internals of uh, our application, uh, the DAM application. When you map uh, DAM with Titan, so all the entities you can assume is a, is a vertex and all the relations are edges. And then we have a concept of collection. So you can think of a subgraph is also an entity for us that could be, uh, I'll show you examples later on, that could be perceived as an asset in our, in our system. <laughs> and entities are indexed in Elasticsearch for properties-based search, so you can query in a, in a very simple way of certain properties of this type or this value and you can get those entities back. So when we start off, uh, this was the architecture. So as you can see in the bottom, we used embedded uh, uh, Titan uh, libraries and we already had hosted solutions for Cassandra and Elasticsearch. So we used uh, leverage that. And on top of that, we had our internal API, which kind of converted the vertex and the edges concept to our own entities and relations. And on top of that, we have a service layer, which kind of puts it into uh, Netflix infrastructure. So we kind of hook into our authorization system, monitoring system, monitoring system, and all those kinds of stuff. And on the top, the API layer, where the CRUD APIs uh, kind of lets you create all these vertexes and uh, I mean, these entities and relations. Search APIs as you search any any of the vertexes or entities. And management APIs all internal. We try to define the schema, entity types, and all that stuff. And for example, re-indexing and all that kind of maintenance stuff, we use the management APIs. But uh, down the road, we kind of changed it a little bit. We had issues with the indexing and elastic search integration with Titan, so we removed it outside. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so in our uh, DAM system, there are basically two things. One is the entity type and one is the entity. Or if you, you will use it interchangeably, asset for us is an entity. So uh, DAM, the A, is an entity for us. 
So entity type, you can think of a schema. So you define saying this entity will have certain properties. So you define it is called as entity type is kind of a schema. And the properties of entity as defined in the schema are like width, height. So an image can have a width, height, that kind of stuff. And entity types can inherit from another entity type and have more properties. So for example, you can inherit from another entity type. The previous one, let's say, had width and height. You can add a color space. So your new entity type will have three properties. And an entity is kind of an instance, if you think of an object, it's an instance. And it is always associated with one entity type. So basically that defines what properties will be in that, in that asset and has relations to other entities. So that is the basic concept of how it maps to TitanDB. So other things that we changed was indexing. So out of the box, indexing was very restrictive. The properties could only index scalar values, right? And since we had multiple entity types, we ran into this problem with the same property name in two uh, entities, uh, two entity types, but the type was different, one was integer, one was string, then it was causing a lot of problems. So what we did was, we started uh, split the indexes, so every entity type was its own index. So that had, now we have multiple indexes, so it helps scale. And then we don't have this property name, uh, different entity types can have the same name at different type. And then it also helped in uh, basically using the entity type as a document into Elasticsearch. So that helps us a lot. The other thing we did was create our own uh, DSL, just to make it simpler. So the search uh, SQL site syntax actually maps to Elasticsearch query. So we made it very simple in the sense it's like a where clause where you can give a property name and type and then you can also use in clause, not clause, that kind of stuff. And also the other stuff that we did was uh, we add our own traversal uh, DSL, which is again like Gremlin, but we convert it internally. So in this case, for example, the, the greater than sign is the direction, and it says which relation type you have to find, and you keep going down like that. So that way you can traverse the graph going and giving the names of the relations that you want to move forward on, or backward on. So you can have both combinations. The other thing that we changed was locking. So out of the box, uh, TitanDB uses Astyanx distributed row lock, which was taking too long. So what normally how it is implemented is it's a blocking lock, which has exponential uh, uh, backoffs and uh, retry mechanisms so for busy locks. So that was causing a lot of problems. So the queries were taking, I mean, the updates were taking a long time. So we kind of removed that and we use our own locking system, which was developed in-house, uh, in it's called Clavis. The idea there was we'll fail fast. So if something happens, we fail fast and client knows whether to retry or ignore it. Maybe he's updating something which is already updated, something like that. And then it can, they can ignore it. So the other part we changed was uh, the uh, TitanDB came up with, op uh, when it came out of the box, it was, it had the Astyanx open source version, but we wanted to use our internal Net Netflix version of Astyanx because it is integrated into our infra infrastructure services, like discovery, so it can find out which cluster to, cl Cassandra cluster to talk to and all that stuff. And monitoring and alerting, so it's all built in that. So that was another big change we made. So here are some statistics that we have collected uh, in the current uh, production. We have uh, approximately 600 million entities in production today, and uh, we, its usage is around 3K uh, requests per second at peak. And uh, we have around 70 uh, entity types, uh, and 10 different types, that is even more today, we are expanding it. And in, in our test cluster, we have around 700 million, but we are experimenting with a lot more uh, because um, down the years we are expecting to this thing to grow exponentially. So this is just a graph from production that 
you can see the average request that is coming out. Uh, these are API calls. And the deployment, so our application dam, we are all in AWS, you must be knowing, and uh, so for our dam, we have like nine nodes with M3.2XL uh, nodes. The Cassandra and Elastic, uh, uh, Elasticsearch cluster is actually handled by CD, Yanis team, and they have like 12 nodes for Cassandra and 18 nodes for Elasticsearch. So we basically take care of our application and uh, the other cluster and Elasticsearch is a different team. Okay, so what are the advantages and challenges we faced when we are doing this? The advantages of uh, Titan or Graph, it is easy to quickly build up relations across assets. As I was saying, we have these concept of a group of assets with some relations we can identify as one entity or one asset. So that's very easy to do. So you can just create uh, relations and you can create this whole subgraph is my asset. So it had traversal queries which helped us and it's highly concurrent. It has OLAP analysis which you don't use yet, but we'll use it in future. And uh, again, as I said, it's an agile data model. So complex models like IMF, I don't know if, or if you know, it's, it's basically a Hollywood standard of delivering uh, digital assets to uh, other third party and it's called interportable master format. So I'll show you an example. It's basically a concept of multiple nodes create one subgraph which can be used as IMF. So this is very easy to do. Okay, the challenges that we faced when we used Titan, as I said, index management was a big problem. Re-indexing via the APIs didn't always work, and indexing failures in ES was not retried. So that caused a huge problem because if the index had failed, we had to keep track what failed, go and re-index it, so it was creating a huge problem. Cleanup is hard, so property keys, you clean it, is hard to maintain it, and the index configuration is also hard to kind of remove and add. And if you change the strategy of how to store, uh, will usually mean we have to recreate the whole thing in a new database. So it was pretty hard there. Uh, again, partitioning of data is hard. So now that we are growing so fast, we are thinking of partitioning it, but it's very hard because uh, we need to have a kind of dividing a graph into two databases, but how do we maintain those relations? So these things we are still thinking of how to do it. Obviously impact of large number of edges, so as, you sh as we showed in the Titan internals, it stores it into Cassandra's uh, row and that becomes a wide row, right, which obviously has its own problems, right? It's very slow, so we are uh, evaluating improvements on that. Multi-level tra traversal is also a problem. We have noticed if you traverse like one or two, two to three maybe, it's okay, but if you go deeper, it becomes really hard. So right now, since we have that, that DSL traversal, DSL, we tell clients to kind of take step by step, not give one query that is too, too deep. And uh, Titan uh, stores the data in Cassandra in a binary, dose, uh, binary uh, format. Now that becomes harder to kind of, uh, what in, in Netflix, we normally, all the Cassandra data goes to analytics and they analyze all that stuff, but you can't do it in this because it's all binary data, they don't know, so we have to have an interpreter, I mean a converter in between, which is also kind of very challenging. Obviously lack of visual tools and uh, there's no free tools available here to show the graph in a good way. We are working on building visualization UI, but still we have not got to the part of showing our data as a graph. But we have built a tool to kind of debug and find out what's happening. So I can give you a little bit demo on that. So here, uh, here is an example. Ozark, by the way, how many people here have seen Ozark? Yes, great show. <laughs> so as you can see, we have a, we, we can query this, uh, like movie, and we can say Ozark, for example, here. And now this is what it is showing is, for this Ozark, 
the entity types are these many and these many are the number of entities in the graph. So in the background, if you think of it, the Ozark movie is a node at the top and then it has relations to all the different types and these are the types. Obviously it's not shown in the graph, that's what I was saying, but we are still working on that. And if you see, this is the actual entities that are under that. And if I open this, you will see this is what the data is. I'll explain what data is right now with an example. So these are all the entities that are there. So coming back to, so some use cases. So let's see some real uh, data and code. So here, so this is what I was saying, the entity type is on the left and entity on the right. So as you can see, we define, let's say this entity type image, we define the keys. This means these are the properties that are allowed for this entity. So this is kind of defined in the schema. On the right hand side, we have some top level stuff, but under metadata, whatever that thing is, that are the properties that go in the vertex. That is a subset of this. So that has real values there. And other stuff is for, we have these standard uh, properties that you have to populate. So in this case, for example, it is saying the top level ID means it is related to that movie. So that's how we searched when you did Ozark, that Ozark ID will be, will be there in that kind of asset. And then at the end there, there's a location of where the actual asset is. So it may or may not be an asset is actually have a location, so that's optional. So for example, in the subgraph I was saying, you could have a node which doesn't have a location. So here is the IMF model. So you can see the whole thing is for us is one asset. So here's how you create it. So if you see on the right hand side, we first create the entity types. So these are all types here. And then we create all the entities, bottom there. And we are just setting one property called subtype. So these things are subtypes, this is just an example. And then we go ahead and use the relations API to create relations between different nodes, different entities. And you can put the direction and everything in there. And here's an example of the traversal API. So in the green is our traversal API and that is how it's converted into Gremlin. So if you look at it, if we start going from the first, it says in the out direction, get me all the relations, which are video track, of type video track and audio track. So if you see from the first, it goes this way, this way, it finds those two relations. And then the next level, it says, go to the segment, find all the segment relations, then it finds these. And the end, it says all the S and then it finds these. So this is how we kind of traverse uh, the graph. And this is where I was saying we, if you have a lot of levels there, we start getting into issues. So we have seen two to three levels works pretty well. So we have asked our clients for now to just do step by step, get one, then the other, then the other. Future plans for them. So obviously we want to upgrade Titan DB into Janus Graph, which is the natural progression. So we are waiting uh, maybe next quarter or next year we will start doing that. And that will also help because we, uh, I think that they're building a better indexing there. So we'll remove all our indexing part from there. Storage optimization, I talked about uh, data is increasing. So we want to see how we can partition and shard stuff. So that we are also looking at. Purpose driven semantic API. So since we are a central place, all the applications that uh, work uh, call uh, DAM, they may not, for them entity may be something else, some other name. So we are trying to see, for example, if you can have APIs for IMS, special for IMS, special for some other type of assets. And integrate events and workflow with them. So since we are a central place and there are a lot of systems around it, uh, we want to see how well we can integrate. For example, if let's say a video is uh, put into a dam, we know that all videos need to be encoded or they have to be watermarked. So what we're planning to do is as soon as we see that an asset of this video type has entered and its status stays active, we want to trigger some workflows which goes and 
I then course it or watermarks it by itself and then puts another asset into, into DAM that is related to this asset saying this is the watermark version of it. So that's what we are planning to do. And that's it. And uh, now Q&A. Mm. Rose, Virin, or uh, is Titan uh, one one dot zero? Yeah. After that, they never changed, right? So it was that way. Can yeah, so question in the microphone, so. uh, could you please talk a little bit more about user case? What exactly uh, Netflix needs to have that query? So here is a here's an example of one simple example of what our data looks like. So as, as you can see, uh, it is very much like a graph. Right, and we need these kinds of traversals. And then as I was talking about these complex uh, entities, so for example, this piece, this is not a good example, but this piece could be called as one asset also, one entity also. So it fitted very well with what we had and what we are going through, that's why. You said there are problems doing multi-level traversals. Yes. So uh, what are those problems? It slows down, right? Yes. And it slows down because uh, you... Because uh, it has to travel. It basically goes in steps, right? And it, it traverses one step after the other. So it takes more time. And we have some SLAs that we can't take so long. So that's the reason. So maybe going forward there's something that has in memory it's easier to find stuff faster that kind of stuff i think you know when you're doing the yeah that's one of the solutions yes but right now we don't yeah looking at this picture it sounds like uh, there is a asset and it has uh, some properties such as metadata mm -hmm. and uh, with the risk of not understanding completely the use cases that you are uh, trying to solve here I'm trying to I'm wondering why graph why not a non graph database because I mean for me without understanding everything it simply looks like a bunch of metadata pertaining to let's say a movie uh -huh. um, so there could be other options I just am wondering about your thought process that landed into this decision. So as I said, naturally the whole, what you call the data set that we have, fits very well in graph. And then as we are expanding, there are new stuff getting added, right? So it is very easy to add another node. For example, today there's a trailer. There could be uh, another kind of, let's say, advertising, the marketing, what you call ads, right? We could easily add that. And then when we don't need to change anything, we are adding a new type and adding it is pretty easy. Next time when you search for that movie, you start seeing, okay, now there's new assets to it. And there's no change from our side. It's just the client saying, okay, uh, I mean, our users saying, okay, there's a new type and you just put it in and then it's ready to go. To add to that, right, um, there are two aspects to it, right? One is, you know, you have the new entities that are coming up on a regular basis uh, with kind of, you know, very, um, as you mentioned, right, very ill-defined properties, right? The properties are, uh, some of the things that we don't mention here is, you know, things which are algo-driven. So, you know, those algorithms are generating data that is hard to predict in future, uh, you know, upfront. The second piece is the relationship between these assets, you know, uh, that is also changing in nature and, you know, building. So, you know, if I were to, for example, model this into a key value pair, a data store, uh, it becomes tricky to figure out how to store the relations. If I put it in relational database, then the cardinality becomes so high that, you know, the expense at which, you know, the queries are going to perform is not sustainable. Uh, the graph kind of gives a bright balance 
though there are kind of you know challenges around performance but we can balance those out by you know putting the right sls for example the use cases where we need to traverse a huge amount of data from the graph that could be kind of an offline processing done through a spark job or something that doesn't have to fit into the sls of few seconds so that's one of the major reasons why we chose to go with uh, graph so what is the range of the sls uh, given that everything is stored in disk so you know it really depends uh, so there are you know if you were to kind of query based on ids uh, then we expect the answers to be given in less than you know uh, 100 milliseconds for example most of the queries if i look at my 90th percentile would be in tens of milliseconds of course you know the performance also is a function of how much data you are yeah. transmitting over the wire right so you know if you are going to start kind of you know streaming the entire data set for a particular movie that's going to take minutes instead of seconds so you know it really depends upon the use cases and the apis are integrated in such a way that you no know, if there is a ui that is driving of this then they are sending the right kind of right kind of queries to perform in the time yeah so obviously for search and traversal we are facing issues but we kind of manage that by pagination or telling people not to do too deep of a traversal in one in one uh, call hello uh, how do you update the graph how do you handle the updates like uh, given that there would be lineages uh, within the graph right so would that be a cascading update or uh, how much deeper do you go how do you decide that so yeah. uh, updates are done two ways right one is you are actually just replacing the entire entity as it is uh, which is one use case where you no know, um let's say you have a new set of data available and then you want to replace it as it is right other thing is that you now we have built versioning semantics uh, that allows somebody to kind of take the existing subgraph and create a new version of it and then look at different versions uh, that's not something that we depicted here in the picture but that's another set of things that we work through in terms of providing very semantic versions on the assets can you hear me that would be the node uh, update right how do you update the edges you you might also need to update the lineages right so if you want to update you can remove it so we have apis to do that but you are saying if you are updating a subgraph or something like that yeah then we'll traverse and go and update everything go and change everything and remove it or uh, change the name for example or remove a relation add a new one i was talking about the uh, scenario where you suppose take video track for example right okay. so you need to uh, add or like update some kind of metadata from the field from that particular node right that might also affect the neighboring nodes no right? it will not if you are updating the property of that vertex then nothing else gets affected if you are updating the relation then yes then we'll make sure that everything is updated and the uh, next question is like how is it different from apache atlas apache atlas yeah so it does the same thing the yeah, apache atlas so uh, it it's an open source version of uh, similar metadata management oh um i'm not too yeah. familiar with apache atlas yeah. uh, you know for us also the need is to build an asset management and the metadata management but very oriented around how we do things and store data in tenfix so you know instead of kind of using something that is out of the box and trying to customize uh, because the challenge always is that you know when it fits more than 80% of use cases then it's easy to kind of take it and put it but you know if you end up utilizing 50% and invest the rest of the 50% trying to make it work then that effort kind of you know becomes more expensive than kind of you know rolling your own uh, with an uh, you know predefined kind of graph storage like a python so uh, so we are using uh, what titan uh, db gives us so so this you're talking about this Titan essentially has 
the storage model, which is pluggable, so very similar to how um, Wetworks does. Uh, the storage layer is abstracted away, and there are different implementations and drivers available. Uh, we use primarily Cassandra, and if I look at the Cassandra, essentially it's an adjacency list, so it stores as key value list, where key being your vertex ID, and you know values are uh, different columns which are stored to hold the properties as well as its uh, relations. Yeah, so properties and edges. So, so that's why if you have, in Cassandra case, if you have lots of relations or edges, then this becomes a wide role, then it creates a problem. It stores the uh, vertex IDs and properties in sorted binary format, which helps them to, to store in sort, sorted order, and it's compressed, so by, bits are compressed, so which tight, it's, it's a Titan DB's own thing. So that's the reason, one of the challenges that we face is, if we want to just take that data from Cassandra and port it to Spark or Haroop, it's not possible. Yeah. You have to read it because it's, a, uh, you can say, a proprietary, their own way of yeah. writing, and that's the only way. So they have their own salty and this. So that's one of the challenges that we just did. OK, let's have one more question, because uh, I'm going for time. So the question was around migration. You mentioned that migration has a lot of challenges. Is that something specific to graph databases, or it was a specific to Titan? Titan. It's more of a Titan, because the thing is, for example, if you want to Let's say we take refreshes from uh, production database or test database. So since it is all binary, we just copy it. But if you need to do something else, for example, do some analytics, then we have to kind of decipher that binary into real stuff, change it, and pass it. And then we have to kind of, when we take the copy, but then the indexes are not there. So we go and do a process in which it goes, reads all the vertexes, and then re-indexes all of them. So these are the challenges that we face. Okay, thank you so much, Vikram and Firuja, for the great presentation. Um, we have desserts and drinks outside. Please um, feel free to stop by, and uh, since all speakers are here, so you can follow up with any questions you have. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for coming today.